Okay, good morning everybody. This is Scott Mendes. We're trying to get ready for our weekly Bible study. See if we can get a good camera angle here. Getting ready to teach in God's Word. We'll allow a few of you to jump on here and get a sound check real quick. Trying to pull everything up this morning. Hope you're having a great weekend. Alright, praise the Lord. we got a few of you coming on here. Alright, let's go ahead and see if we can get a sound check. I'm going to turn this volume down just a little bit. See if you guys can get me. Good morning, everybody. See a few of you jumping on here. Uh, let me see. We should have some sound on here. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the Brooklyn Tabernacle. There we go. All right, we're going to allow everybody just a moment to jump on here. And then we'll get right into this morning's uh, study together. Good morning, Jesse, Maya. See if we can get a sound check as well. Thumbs up. Good morning, Gail. Sometimes the sound check's a little bit of a distraction. Going to make sure. Let me know. Good morning, Diane. Praise the Lord. Carrie. Casey. I wish I had some of that coffee. It's been a long morning already. Praise the Lord. Well, we're excited about what we want to teach on. Hopefully you guys can just let me know. Thumbs up on the sound and then we'll get right after it. I've got a really powerful, fun message for us this morning. I believe it's going to help us all uh, to grow as we study it together. Let me go ahead and pull this down. I'm assuming that we've got pretty good sound. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, if you uh, join us each week, you know we like to have a Bible or some kind of... Uh, writing instrument that you can scratch down some scriptures and memorize them and go over them throughout the week. Let me pull this up right here and see if I can't, uh, let me see. I want to be able to see if I can pick this up on my monitor real quick before we pray. Again, if you guys don't mind just liking and sharing, getting it out there, that really helps. Uh, looks like we've got our faithful on here this morning. Not able to pull this up on my monitor yet. I don't want that to be a, a distraction, but let me see. Praise the Lord. Hopefully you guys can hear. Thumbs up. Glory to God. All right, there it is. Okay, just as long as I can see that everything's uh, going well. Well, again, I'm Scott Mendes with Western Harvest Ministries. We do a weekly Bible study each week from on the road or here at our fellowship center, depending on whether we're traveling. Just to give you guys an update, we will be traveling this week up to Missouri, taking some uh, traveling partners and friends of the ministry and speaking at a men's conference, probably three, four, five hundred men we're expecting. There's some promotions out this week. I'll share those with you guys as well. Thank you for sending us out and for partnering with us. God is good. So as you know, each week we like to open up with a few prayer requests. We pray, then I teach in God's word together, and then we'll pray at the end. And this week's message is uh, got a lot of scriptures, but it's really uh, one that I believe that's in, uh, a timely word for the season that we're all in and help us to grow spiritually and to discern some things that God is doing. As you know, some of the things that we want to pray about, they had devastating tornadoes down here in the southwest um, going through Oklahoma, Kansas, way up there in Iowa. Man, there's no telling the devastation of life. So we want to pray for those who have been affected by the tornadoes. As you know, God gives us clues that in the signs of the times we would see tornadoes, war, famine, pestilence, all of those. Matthew uh, 24, go read it, study it, and don't be in fear, but also be aware of what God is doing in these times. Amen? So it's very important. Uh, a couple of my partners and friends have grandchildren. Uh, Ronnie's grandson, Carter, had a baseball injury. Pretty devastating. Scotty Carter on our speaking team over in Mississippi, his granddaughter, Bella. Um, just, again, we want to pray for you guys and all those needs as well. If you have them, continue to send them in. We like to pray over them when we get them, but then we also pray together if we can and uh, uh, each week as well as we stand together on God's Word. Also, I just want to pray for our local, national, and global governments. We have a lot of situations that are taking place in this election year that we need to stand against 
and be aware and stop the bleeding over our nation by putting God back where he belongs. Amen. Uh, thank you, ministry partners. Thank you for praying for our travels as well. And so having said that, we got a great message this morning. We need to really get into uh, uh, to the scriptures and to bring this message apart. So uh, bring this message uh, to pass in your life. So having said that, let's go before the Father in prayer real quick. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for this day that you've created. Father, we know that your word is your will. Father, we know that your word is to penetrate the hearts and the minds of your children, those who are called, those who are equipped. Father, those that answer the call of ministry on their life, servitude, servant, uh, to be a servant leader, Father God, is to bless you, to honor you. And so, Father, we honor you this morning. We lift up uh, Ronnie's grandson, Carter. We lift up Scotty Carter's daughter, granddaughter, Bella. Father, these physical healings, we ask that you touch them. Go where they are, Father God, and do your deep work in their life. Comfort the family, strengthen them. Kaysen, Father, we continue to uh, continue to pray for him. There's so much need in the world today, and we just ask, Father, that our governments, our families, we will be strong never to compromise our core values and our beliefs of who we are, to walk in love, to walk in humility, but to walk in righteousness and uprightness, Father God, with the fruit of the Spirit, guiding our steps every day through the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we thank you for our ministry travels. We pray for all of our partners that have faithfully faithfully been watching these Bible studies and growing spiritually. May you be glorified in their life and help them to have that covenant relationship where you can steer, direct, and guide their futures, Lord God, in, your, in you. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's children said... Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm excited about what we want to teach on this morning. And I know that it's going to really bless you. We've got to keep moving. Um, and again, I pray that it's something that you guys will be able to share and uh, to sow into the lives of others. Quite a bit of reading and illustration this morning. But if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to the book of James? James is going to be our foundational Scripture. I love the book of James. Uh, some life scriptures in there. But James chapter 4. And again, what we're going to try to do this morning as we read, I've cut a lot of the scriptures out to help us. Um, I pray that the way I teach uh, encourages you guys and it really blesses you guys as well um, in a lot of ways. So we're going to have a foundational scripture of James chapter 4. And we're going to be reading verses 13 through 17. And then I want to tell you what the title of this morning's message is. I'm going to use some, some quotes, some stories, uh, and some bullet points. We want to talk about three things that are found in this passage of Scripture. So having said that, we're going to title this, Writing in View of God's Will. <clears throat> we're going to define it, but there's three categories in this Scripture that we're going to read right now in this passage of Scripture. So, <clears throat> excuse me, having said that, Let's read this, and then we're going to teach on it a little bit this morning. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. I read out of the New King James Version, and then we're going to talk about it. And I believe this is really going to bless all of us when we're talking about writing with the Lord's view, uh, in view of God's will. We're writing towards His will. We know about it. As we break it down today, I, help, I pray that it will help you to apply it to your life. No matter what's going on in this world we got to study to show ourselves approved. And we're going to be in class here or we're going to be in class in heaven. But we need to know God's word and how to be discerning of the times that we live in. So let me read this here. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Ready? Let's read. It says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, and buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. Verse 15. Instead you ought to say, If it's the Lord's will, we shall live and do this or that. But now... You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting 
is evil. And you go on to verse 17, it says this, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. So we're going to use this passage of Scripture this morning as a foundation. We're going to pull out three things that we see God's view for His children, the believer. Now, I'm asking and believing that you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or that this message will encourage you to get some things clear so that we can walk and we can be blessed in God's will. So again, the, the message this morning is writing in view of God's will in our life. And we're going to talk about three things this morning that I think will really encourage you. Amen? So I'm going to speak loud. I'm going to read. I'm going to teach uh, these three points with all the helps that I have here today. So there was a, a young pa a pastor that was talking to a young man at a, concert, uh, a conference one time, and he said, Preacher, I would give my life to the Lord, but I am afraid. And the pastor said, to which he replied, of what are you afraid? And this young man said, I am afraid that the Lord will ask me to do something dangerous. And so we see right now, right off the bat, this is a category of most Christians, Christians that we know today. They know that God has a will for their life, but they're afraid of it. And so afraid of what the Lord may ask them to do. I know personally, I used to be afraid to become a Christian because it would create a lot of controversy a lot of persecution with my traveling partners, the organizations that I rode for. But one day I finally fell to my knees in humility and I received the Lord and I started seeking and riding towards the view of His will for my life. And I want to encourage you guys to ex do exactly that. So the dangerous thing is life is not the will of God, but out being out of the will of God. May I say that again? Being out of the will of God is dangerous. Being in the will of God is peaceful and brings forth a lot of blessings and promises. So, let's go on. When James begins this chapter that we just read, chapter 4, he begins to talk about a war with God, but he ends up talking about the will of God. And so we see right now that we're not promised tomorrow. And I don't want to get ahead of my notes, because as I brought forth and studied and, and laid all this out for us this morning, it all ties together. So please... If you have the ability to stay with me or just turn up and listen to the Word of God this morning. So there's two themes that actually go hand in hand together. Because when a person is not in the will of God, he becomes a troublemaker and wages war with God. Let me say that again. If you're not walking in divine covenant and relationship and in the will of God, you are at war with God in your soul, your mind, your will, your emotion. I didn't say that. God said it in His Word. And so I want to help us to get, understand, to discern what God's will is. If you're, if you're teaching, your thoughts, your doctrine is off a bit, then you're going to have trouble because you're going to water it down, you're going to preach it out, you're going to cherry pick it, you're going to have hyper grace, replacement theology, and all the things that we talk about. But at, at the end of the day, it's error. Error breeds error. Truth breeds truth. And there's only one source of absolute truth, and that is the Word of God. So God is a God of love. Also, God is a God of wisdom, and that it shouldn't surprise anyone that He has a plan for your life, for each one of our life, my life, your life, even though it's not the same. There are corporate and there's general guidelines of God's will, but there's a specific will of God for you that you have to find out. Nobody should be surprised by that. He knows what ought to happen and when it should occur. He is a God of love and He desires nothing but the very best for His children. Are you a child of God? Not by label, not by going to church, not by having a bumper sticker on your car. Are you a child of God by relationship? Have you surrendered to the supreme authority of God the Father, accepting His Son in your life? If you are, now you need to look at God's will for your life, not just believers, but specifically in your area. And that's what this message is about. Sadly, though, many Christians look on the will of God as something they must take instead of something that is set the evidence of his love towards us. God loves us. God has a plan. There's a big word, destiny. There's a lot of words that today, universe, 
supreme power, higher power. Don't get caught in garbage doctrine or philosophies that pull you away from God's will, God's covenant. So just know this, when people start talking about higher powers, supreme powers, that, that's not what we're talking about. And, and sadly, many Christians just think that they have to uh, take instead of seeing the evidence that God loves us by providing his will for us. Amen. So let me illustrate some of this. One time there was a young man talking to another pastor about he did not want to surrender to the call of ministry on his life. And so what happens to this young man? He didn't surrender to God's will. And so God loved him enough to to allow these things to happen in his life. So they talked about it on many occasions. The pastor asked him to surrender his life to the Christian service, but he never would submit to God's will for himself. And so what happened? Uh, he never submitted, and so he discovered the hard way that when God cannot rule, he overrules. And what happens is we see that this young man went through severe financial difficulties, mental challenges, marital problems. And then one night he got back to the pastor and he said years later that he called the pastor and he says, I have surrendered my life to the call of ministry that is on it. And then what he said was, I discovered that I instantly had the peace that I was looking for before I submitted to the will of God. And so you got to get first things first. And that took several years of torment and devastations and involvement. And God's not going to change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's called you to an office. He's called you to a ministry. Whatever that is, you have to discover that. But He loves you. And so He allows these things to go through. So why are we talking about that this morning? The reason many Christians are unhappy and without joy or without peace is because they are continually at war in their hearts because they are out of the will of God for their life. So the verses that we read this morning, there are three different things that we want to identify when we're writing with the view of God's will for our life. It's right there. We can see it. We know it. We sense it. So there's three groups of people that we just read in James chapter 4 verses 13 through 17. Now let's begin to teach this morning. The first point is there is there's they're ignorant to the will of God. We read that in verses 13, 14, 15 and 16. They're ignorant. They don't know about it. They don't believe it. They don't apply it. They don't practice the will of God. Maybe they've been told they were saved and that's all they had to do. They can continue to live the way they used to. That is error, and it produces error. So here's a group of people that measure success in life by how many times they got their own way or accomplished what they had planned. That's simply it. They are ignorant to the will of God. Don't allow that in your life and in your relationship with God. Don't be ignorant. We're talking about it. Once you have received it, you studied it, you read it, you meditate on it, you are accountable for that seed of God that has been sown in your life. The enemy comes immediately to steal and kill and abort the dreams and the seed that God has given you, that he has educated you with, that has given you passion and desire, but you're using it on your own will for the things in the world. That is being ignorant of God's will. James gives us four arguments that reveal foolishness and ignoring the will of God and living life without Him. So let's talk quickly about the complexity of life. This is under the ignorance of knowing about God's will. And when we're done with today's teaching, you will have a better understanding that you are saved and you are now going to work out your salvation and be sanctified every day by growing in the will of God specifically for you and corporately for the body of Christ as believers. So the complexity of life. Here is a description of the, etern uh, the earthly life at its best. Planning, buying, selling, making money, and enjoying the materialism of this world. Now, you can enjoy all those things and say, I'm in God's will because I have the ability to have those things without being in debt or inheritance or whatever those things may be. But the reality is, life is complex. Life is made up of people and places, activities and goals, days and years. Each of us make crucial decisions every day concerning our future. 
Yes, we do. But do we make those outside of the parameters of God's will for your life? As you are not being ignorant, you will make decisions in the boundaries of God's love, God's chastisement for when we are out of his out of his will. And so we see this life is never easy. Let me say that life is never easy. It is always more complex than we are able to figure out or plan for. But God brings order, meaning that the unity of life, because he is a God of order. The word of God says that God does everything decently fitted and joined together. He made apostles, teachers, prophets, ministers, pastors, people of service. All these things are gifts and skills. But we find our place in the body of Christ and then we go about glorifying our Father by surrendering our life and making our bodies of a holy sacrifice unto Him. Then we find peace. So let's continue. God is a God of order. Say that with me. God is a God of order. He has a specific plan and will for my life. He has a corporate plan for the believers, the church, and those that are His children. So don't Call yourself a child if you've not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Don't call yourself a believer if you don't live for Him wholeheartedly every day. I'm just being true. And if you're doing it wrong, repent. Turn from those ways and apply the truth of God's Word. So we see this. There's a complexity to life. There's an uncertainty to life. Proverbs 27 1 says it this way. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knoweth not what a day may bring forth. Again, Proverbs 27, 1. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Amen? Isn't that good teaching? Now, let's go on. So we see here there are planning. We, there's nothing wrong with planning for a year in advance. Counting you know, your chickens before they're hatched. No one but God knows what the future will hold. So we plan, but God directs the footsteps of the righteous, his children. He wants to help you to avoid that relationship. He wants to help you to avoid that pain of being outside of his will. And so we need to be teachable. Tomorrow never comes. We always live in the present, never the future. No one has been promised tomorrow. There is nothing wrong with making plans. Let me say that again. There's nothing wrong with making plans, but we should do, we would do well to remember that God and God alone holds the plans for tomorrow and the future in the palm of his hands. That's who we serve. We serve an almighty God that is omnipresent and that he knows every hair on your head. He knows your future. And as we plan, that's good, but let's plan in view of God's will for our life. Amen. So, brevity of life so in other words there's a shortness of life right i had to look that up in the dictionary uh i what there was a lady that was 114 years old that seemed to have a long time but compared to eternity that is only a vapor of time how far are we promised 80 120 Man is limited on this earth, but we shall go into eternity, and that is the will of God. But God provides the will that we can endure and and manifest and bring forth those things in this life. Not just for when we get there. There's a lot of false teaching. We have to have power. We have to have direction and guidance in the will of God in this life so that we can graduate into that life with eternity with Him. So, when we were a kid, birthdays came very long term. And now all of a sudden as we get older, birthdays and occasions come more often because time is going fast. So we see there's a shortness of life. We count our life in years, but God tells us in Psalms 90 and verse 12 that we are to count the days. So there's a big difference between planning for days, planning for years, Either way, God has given us wisdom that we should plan ahead, trusting Him in the days that He will be with us and in those trials or in those circumstances to protect us. And the more circumstances, the more trial, the the, the tougher that we become. And God loves us to allow us to go through those things to equip us for the task that He's called us to. So you need to understand that. Uh, no, no, ha- no has the promise. No one has the promise of tomorrow. We are all have 
this in the moment. We cannot afford to merely spend our lives. We can't afford to spend our lives. However, we can certainly don't have, uh, we don't want to waste our lives. So you can spend your life looking for stuff that makes you happy and never find it. But you can get in the divine will of God specifically for you and you will find happiness, peace, and contentment as you do that. But we can't waste our time. So we must invest our lives. Don't spend it. Don't waste it, but invest our lives in those things that which are eternal. Now we are complete. We are happy. We are prosperous in text. We're not prosperity thinking. We're not lame, claiming it into all these things that are being taught throughout the world today. So we have to remember what Jesus said in the story of Luke 12. I got to talk really quite quick because this is a, a long study this morning. We're still on point one about being ignorant to the will of God. We got two more points, so bear with me. In Luke 12, Jesus talked about the man who had the bumper crop, right? And what did he say? He said "Your barn, his, the man's idea was his barns were too small, so he built bigger barns. And remember what Jesus said in Luke 12. He said, I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But then God's reply said to the man who was boasting was this, Thou fool, this very night thy soul will be required of thee. Your mind, your will, your emotion." He thought he had prosperity. He stored it up. And what happened? He was outside of the will of God because he was a hoarder. He wasn't trusting on God's resources. And God said, you are a fool. And this very night, your life will be taken from you. So I say, I will say to my soul, soul. Uh, of course, we just read that. That is Luke chapter 12. Let me go on a little farther. Life is, is not uncertain to God. But when we know him, we are in his will. My question is, you can't know the will of God unless you know God that gives the will. So make sure that you are truly saved, reborn, baptized into the Holy Spirit, know your covenant, walking hand in hand with him. And if you do know him, then you're in his will. And you can be confident of tomorrow, here and there, in the earth and into the heavens when we will spend eternity with our Father. Get it straight. Post-rapture, pre-rapture, there's a lot of stuff that is not in your Bible that you have taken the word of somebody, allowed it to get in your heart to take root. We must uproot error and we must not be in fear. We must be teachable to know the will of God. Amen. Still, some will say, I have the rest of my life to live for God. That is the enemy. That is a lie. Friends, nothing could be further from the truth this morning. Don't allow the devil to lie, steal, and kill, and destroy. But allow the truth that you know and you apply to set you free. The truth is, God loves you, God has a will, and God saved you for a purpose. So, that's, that's a lie. You don't have time. You're not promised tomorrow. Get it right today. Now, the, sec the other category was the for for frailty of life, which means physical weakness or... Uh, health or strength and actually a moral weakness frailty I might not be saying that right but I look to the dictionary and we can have frailty of life by being morally weak and so we think to ourselves that we are so strong we are in control yet even if one of our cells in our brain is damaged it would throw off the whole circuit and the whole system and, and, and even if we caught a, a bacteria a virus cancer in the day, HIV, all those kind of things. One little minute cell in our brain could throw off the whole system. So why are we saying that? Because we like to take credit of how much we know and, and, and that we are sometimes even, you know, God's in and of ourselves. So still, we take credit. These are points I'm just talking about right here. The frailty of life. God designed us uniquely, wonderfully, fitly, joint that he create us. So we take credit for who we are and what we are. We totally ignore the hand of God at work in our life. That is a humanist. That is an evolutionist. That is all the poisonous doctrine we see coming in to telling our children in the education system today, in the medium, in the, in the entertainment world. It is a lie. It's telling them 
ignorance, they think that they can choose who they are when God designed them uniquely. So we need to get that straight. Man cannot control the future, which is why we are worried. Man does not possess the ability to see the future, much less the power to control it. Amen. We need to be humble servants of our Lord. We need to understand where the truth and the beginning of what God wants us to know is all about. For as we boast about our success, we make ourselves out to be gods or to be God. Would it be like trying to find our way through a dark jungle without a map? See, we are not, we didn't raise or create ourselves. God created us with a manual and a handbook. The Bible and the will of God as we're studying right now. So the first point was, don't be ignorant to the will of God. Amen? Sometimes I want to make sure I don't get so going ahead that you guys miss the point. We're talking about writing with the view of God's will in our life. God specifically and uniquely designed you, but we cannot be ignorant of His will by false teaching, by thinking that we are God's or we are so gifted, we are so successful, we enjoy the material things, we work hard, we owe it to ourselves. Self, 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 self is the devil because that is the bait of Satan, offensiveness, uh, rejection. Anger, strife, all the works of the flesh lead us out of the will of God when the fruit of the Spirit leads us into the peace and discernment and the wisdom of God to go through this world that has fallen, that serves other gods, but we serve Yeshua, our true God, the God that we love and the God that we know is able to lead our life. So let's go on. We talked about being ignorant to God's will. The second view is they disobey the will of God. This is the second group of people in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, our foundational scripture. Here is where most Christians fit in. They know the will of God, but they choose not to obey it. This is the view, or this view is worse than the first, for the person of God says, I know you want me to do this, to preach, to test, to testify, to witness, etc. But I prefer not to do it. I know more about my life and what I need than you do. That is ignorance. That is disobedience instead of obedience to the will of God. And this is what you're going to have as a byproduct. Listen to Second Peter 2 and verse 21. It says, for it had been better if for it would have been better for them the people listening right it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them god said either be hot or be cold but don't be lukewarm if you know that god's called you to the ministry you answer that call if you need to know God's will for your life specifically, and you know that God generally has a will for the body of Christ, His children, you begin to study it out and apply it. Nothing manifests or brings forth fruit without application. Faith without works is dead. So you have to apply God's will through the decision, through the heart, and you do it with the right motives, and you produce a harvest in your life, right? So... God said it had been better for them not even to know my will than to deny it or disobey it. So why do people disobey God's will? Number one, of course, is pride. Man likes to boast that he is the master of his own fate. He is the captain of his own soul. Man has accomplished so much that he thinks he can do anything of his own accord. But I'm telling you, that man will be defeated and crumbled and likely miss an opportunity to live with his master in heaven, he will go straight to hell in that own repulsiveness, in pride, spiritual pride. The pride of life will take us away from the blessings of God. So let's go on. Pride is one of the reasons they disobey God's will. Ignorance is another one. We act as though the will of God is something that we can accept or reject, but the reality is the will of God is not an option. It is an obligation. There's a big difference between an option that you can choose or an obligation that God has commanded that we that love Him, that have chosen Him, that have accepted Him and submitted to Him, 
should abide under that authority. And the will of God will be a blessing to our lives. So the threat to the will of God as such is to invite the chastising hand of God into our life. To threat, to treat the will of God as such is to invite the chastising hand of God into our life. You disobey God, God will turn you over to the tormentors. He will allow you to have marital problems, mental problems, uh, physical problems in your life, not because He doesn't love you, but because you've chosen to abide not under the shadow of the Almighty. You went out of the encampment. You went out of His presence into your own wilderness. And there you will be defeated and tormented until you repent and ask God's forgiveness. You clean your heart. You get back in right standing and righteousness. You come into the presence of God and say, Lord, I don't want to go that way again. I'm not the master of my own soul. I'm not the captain of my own fate and so forth and those things that we read earlier. So you have to be humble. You have to be tired of being sick and tired to go and obey the will of God over your life. It is an obligation and a covenant and a commandment, not an obligation to just choose or to reject and still think you're going to be blessed. I'm telling you, there's people listening to this message today that call yourself a child of God that is outside of of the camp of God. You're over there doing it on your own. You're out there struggling. You're having problems and you love God in your heart, but your mind has not been renewed. And so there is a war against God as what we read in James chapter 4. Now let's go on. The will of God is not a formula or a mis mis misery, a um, formula for misery. No, it is the disobedience to the will of God that makes people miserable. It is when you disobey the will of God on your life, you become miserable, you open the door for chastisement, and those that God love, He chastises. Why? Because He's strengthening us in the faith that we will need to be dependent on the resources and to overcome in the fallen world that we live in here to rejoice in the benefits that we someday will receive in heaven. Someday we're not there. He's got a plan for us today. Your plan may be different, but our corporate plan as the church and true believers, the remnant of God, rise up in these times and not compromise with the world. That means we're obeying God's will. So let's go on. He says right here in Luke 12, uh, verse 47, he says, The servant which knows the Lord's will and prepares not himself, neither did according to the, his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. If you're struggling to know God's will for your life, if you're struggling to obey God's will, you need to hear this message. You need to understand that you can't be ignorant of God's will and or you cannot disobey God's will. And God has a will for you. Get in His presence, get in a relationship and ask Him. You have not because you ask not. Now, I'm not going to read it, but according to Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11, He says the disciple or the discipline of the Lord is evidence of his love, not his hatred. Chastising brings the comfort and the evidence that our salvation is real. Unless you want to go around the mountain again of your free will for choosing to disobey or to be ignorant, either way, you can go around that mountain again or you can stop the rhetoric and the and the and the irrational thoughts and the, the torment and the and the disbelief and all those things you can stop by saying, Lord forgive me, I've been disobedient. And it may not seem like a big thing now, but there will come a day when you will stand before the judgment of the Lord. And then the Bible says, He that doeth wrong shall receive for his wrongdoing. And of course that is Colossians three, verse twenty five. You will receive for what you've done, whether it be good or or whether it be bad. And I want to receive for the good that I've done. And I want to repent for the bad that I have done. Nobody is perfect. But as we press into God. In a relationship with His Holy Spirit. He will comfort us. Strengthen us. And teach us. Amen. A few more minutes. Let's go on. So we've talked about writing in view of the will of God. It is right there for you today. If you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. And you be reborn and you have a relationship with Jesus. You're not a religious person that doesn't know anything about how God operates or his divine nature. 
and you are excited about being a servant leader. You are excited and passionate for standing up and being a vocal witness in the community that you live in, wearing your colors and who you give tribute to and what you invest in because where your heart is, there is your treasure. Amen. So you have not, you should not be ignorant of God's will and you should not de de disobey the will of God. Many scriptures that we've read this morning verify that that's God's word saying it and not just me preaching it to you, right? And so we've got to roll up our sleeves, get on the, get on your overalls and show up to work. Get your work gloves out and be ready to go on assignment for the adventure that God has given you on a journey called life. Is it fair? No. Is it short? Yes. And we are going towards a goal of eternal dwelling for the place that God has reserved for you, your spiritual man, to be with him someday in heaven. But that someday is not now. He's not going to just suck us out of here because the church is being defeated. No, we are the church. We are the mighty men and women of God that should rule and reign and take back our country for what is most important, our family, our faith, and our God. And the things that we give tribute to should be towards that which we love. And we love God. So let's go on. The last view that we want to talk about is to obey the will of God. Verse 15 that we read. If the Lord will is not a statement on the believer's lips, it is more of an attitude of our heart. Should the Lord tarry, I will do this tomorrow. I will plan to do that. I will be prepared to do that. I will be equipped. But I want to have total dependency on the Lord. You plan, but it depends on the Lord if it manifests so that He can get the glory. See, I think a lot of believers want the glory. They look so pristine and they're so educated. They use big words and they have all the fancy stuff. But inside their heart is wicked and far from him because it is an outward appearance to have look at me. I don't want you to look at me. I want you to look at him because apart from him, I can do nothing. But I want you to focus on obeying the will of God in your life. Jesus said it this way. He said the meat to, is, Jesus said my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Anybody can start not everybody finishes. So maybe you can look back in your life when you were truly saved and you were walking in the right relationships. You were in the will of God. You were blessed. You were healthy. You were maybe going through stuff. You're not perfect. Nobody is. But you knew that you were doing what God put peace in your heart to do. Let's go back and find that time and be obedient to the will of God on our life. <clears throat> so not only to start it, the meat of it is to do what he who sent me. Jesus is telling us what the will of God is in his word through the word of God the Father to us. And the Holy Spirit corrects us, chastises us when we're wrong. But are we so prideful and so arrogant that we don't want to repent or we want to keep looking good about how great we are making ourselves out to be God? And there's a whole bunch of that in the Christian bookstores today. There's a whole bunch of that in our music. There's a whole bunch of that in our church. You receive it and it drops into your mind. It's a thought. And if you don't take that thought captive and make it obedient to the Word of God, it falls down in your heart. Now it's a belief system and it's a root and it's embedded and it produces things in your life. And what we have to do is up, uproot the root to change the fruit that you're getting in your life. I can't take credit for that because my mentor in Bible school helped me to understand that. Choices, free will, character is what I'm talking about. Having integrity, having honor, not making yourself out to be all these things, but making Jesus out to be the role model, making him to be famous, making him in the relationship with those that need him, leading them to the foot of the cross. So everything in this universe operates according to laws. And when we obey the will of God, it does not shackle the Christian, but it opens up the doors that sets the Christians free. 
Now we're talking about the governing rules, the general rules that God put in place in the universe. I'm not talking about yoga. I'm not talking about mind control and the cellular level and changing our DNA and all the things that we see with AI and secular humanism. I'm not talking about that kind of universe control, the law of attraction. No, I'm talking about keeping the word of God in its text and serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So that opens the door when we obey the will of God. Everything that operates are according to law. So when we cooperate with these laws, they work for us. But we keep it in biblical view. We fight and disobey those laws of the universe. They work against us, right? So don't get caught up in all of this, this Middle Eastern stuff. I'm telling you, there's a lot of psycho-cybernetics. There's a lot of mind control. There's a lot of sorcery that enters into the church. It creeps in. It takes prey. And it sets traps. And if you fall into it, you'll say, oh, wow, this is great. I can be my own God if I control my mind. If I claim these things to come my way, then I'll have all this stuff. No, you better do it biblically. Or you will go on a one-way street and you will end up in a place called nowhere and you will be judged, and God will send you apart from him, away from him at that time, because you did things in his name, but you did not know him. I don't know who that's for, but I pray somebody will watch that, and I receive it to me. I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about my father's business. Amen. So, let's go on. Sometimes, uh, some things are true for all Christians, like yielding ourselves to him. Now, here's the general wills of God that God has planned over the individual's life or specifically, but there's still the laws that we abide by in God's will. So what are some of God's will? When we yield ourselves to him, 2 Corinthians 8, 5, or when we avoid sexual immorality, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, and then also when we rejoice and we pray and we give thanks to God, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. These are general wills that we must abide by when we submit to Him, when we avoid dangerous things, when we do not put God to the test, when we allow our lives to be orchestrated by the divine nature and will of God. That is for all of us, the church, the believers, His children. I'm not talking for those who have not uh, made Jesus the Lord of their life. Let them stay in the wilderness until they're tired and you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Until they're tired of going through their misery and torment, they have to come under the submission of God and receive him and ask forgiveness. You and I can't forgive them. We can just lead them to the one that can, right? And we love them unconditionally, no matter what pit of life they are in. And that is so important. So let's go on. If uh, everything in the world in this book addresses believers as part of the will of God, and it is meant to be obeyed, the will of God generally for the church and for the believers, amen, is for all. Then specifically, you get into it and God will reveal that to you. If we disobey God's will, it doesn't mean that we are, uh, remain out of His will. It, it, it doesn't mean that we remain out of His will for the rest of our life. The will of God is meant for us to be in a living relationship with Him as a believer. When you get out of God's will, you can expect to suffer. Say that with me. Out of God's will, suffering will occur. Chastisement, He allowed it because He is training us and He loves us to allow us to struggle so we understand how to depend on Him. And He will receive you back by repentance. Right? Amen. And so, you expect suffering when you're out of God's will because God will bring you back into His will just as Jonah just ask Peter, amen, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it, so he's going to change your heart in the process. You're doing it because, eh, you know, whatever reason. But if your heart's not right, your motive is not right, God will allow you to struggle until you figure out how to make him glorify, how to passionately praise him, honor him, be thankful to him. So, real quick. I'm going to give you four or five things that we know that God wants you to have. He wants you to know His will. Acts 22 verse 24 says this, The God of our Father hath chosen thee that thou should know His will. Thee is you and me as soon as we receive Him into our heart. 
Let him take up residency. He's knocking at the door of your heart right now and he's asking you to repent for a religious relationship. He wants you to come into the household of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords today. So he wants you to know his will. He also wants you to understand his will. Ephesians 5.17 says it this way, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding that the will of God the will of the Lord is understanding what the will of the Lord is. He doesn't want us to be ignorant. He doesn't want us to disobey it. He wants us to obey it. So he gives us his word. He gives us pastors and teachers and mentors and people to disciple us, to raise us up in the admiration. Parents in the admiration, the children will be raised in the admiration, the fear of the Lord. So he gives us all these resources, but if we reject them and think that we know how to do it on our own, we will be ignorant, unteachable, we will go out to the wilderness, and we will suffer because we are out of the will, divine will of God for our life. So here is the wisdom that comes. A child knows the will of his father, but he may not understand his will. God wants you to know both, to know it and to understand it. How do you understand it? You have to live it. You have to apply it. You have to go through some struggles. You have to not give up. You have to understand that God loves you no matter how much you've failed. But keep getting back up as a champion of Christ. Get back on that horse that throws you off. Get back into that place where you've given up and you've been tormented and you listened to a lie that pulled you away from God's word. Also, he wants us to prove his will. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may test and prove what is that acceptable, good, and perfect, and pleasing will of God. The Greek word to mean prove by existence. We learn to determine the will of God by working at it. The more we obey, the easier it is for us to know how to do it, such as swimming, singing, working, roping, writing. The more we do it, the better we get, right? We should be working at being a better believer, a better child of God, better at loving our Heavenly Father, putting our investment, our time, our talents, our treasures into God so that we can be blessed. He wants us to know His will from our heart. Ephesians 6, 6 says it this way, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servant of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, the spirit, the soul, and the body. And when these things are in alignment to God in a relationship with the help of the Holy Spirit, we produce harvest. We produce fruit. And that fruit is that others around us can be blessed and that we can know who we are, why we were born on this earth, and what our position is and how to ride through life knowing the will of God. Amen. I have just a few more moments, so I want to wrap it up by saying this. He wants us to do His will because he, because we love Him, not because we are afraid of getting a whooping, right? We're not afraid of God, but I have a reverential fear of God, and if God wanted to spite me, He could do that right now and take me out. And I'd never have more opportunity, but He gives me life in breath. He gives me a body to take care of. He gives me a wife to love me. He gives me a, our children to bring us joy. He does all these things that we may be complete, lack, and not missing anything in our life. So the whole secret to a happy life is to delight in duty. You are, but you are missing the blessing because we are doing it and toiling with it, playing with it, knowing about it, disobeying it, seeing it on the other side of the fence, chasing things, not being content with the things that you have, growing to get better things in God's time, doing it all on your own, labors and work and covetousness and idolatry, and wanting to be like these people you're following, buying into their books and their tapes and their, their ways of doing it because they have it all figured out. And if you can figure it out by giving them money, then you're going to have it figured out. You can stop all that hoopla by being right with your father. And spending time in His presence. So you may serve the Lord grudgingly or out of obligation. But you would be missing the blessing. Don't just endure. Thrive. And you're missing the blessing because of what you are doing. Is you're toiling instead of ministering to your Father. 
Give him your first love. Give him everything, your first fruit, your mornings. Give him your time of energy, your hobbies. Serve him with it. Be a witness for him. And when you do those things, you will be blessed. And lastly, he wants you to have eternal life. Second Peter 3 verse 9 says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but in long suffering to, towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all man should come to repentance. Amen. And so with just a few moments left to wrap this up, I want to tell you this. Jesus died so that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord, He died for you. And friends, God will allow you. God wants to be friends with you, but He wants to be your Heavenly Father. He wants to train, raise you in the admiration and the fear of His Father. He said, I do nothing but which I see my Father do. We do nothing which we see Jesus do, right? And so He loves you. He died for you. He reserved a place in heaven with you. Do you receive that promise? Or do you have that promise? Do you know it? Don't think you are, that you're never going to fail because you will. And don't think your failure is going to be permanent because you can change that with a relationship with the Lord. Not a religious relationship, but a covenant relationship. And we can also confess our sins and receive forgiveness according to 1 John 1, 9. We can learn from our mistakes and we can import the things. We can understand the important things in our life is having a heart that loves God and wants to do His will for His life. So let me give you these questions before I pray with you. Which of these viewpoints do you hold toward the will of God? You're ignorant to it, you disobey it, or you obey it. Are you ignorant to the plans and the decisions that you make? Or do you, uh, do you not know what God wants you to refuse the things of the world and come into His way of doing things? Amen? Either way is clearly wrong, but both bring sorrow and ruin to the life of the person outside of God's will. For, for the Christian who knows and loves and obeys, you will enjoy the blessings of God. Life may not be easier, but it will be happier and it will be more fulfilling and you will know that you are in right standing with your heavenly Father. Amen. I pray with all diligence that this message has helped you to discern what God's will is for your life. I struggled for many years rodeoing what God's will was for me. I felt like selfishly if I have this golden buckle, right, and make somebody out of me that everybody will want to hear how I got it or, or, or all the steps that I took towards getting it. In reality, I needed to submit to God's plan. God would bless me with that if I would use that platform for Him today as I have tried diligently to do with this message. I want to pray for you today as we wrap this message up in the next few minutes. I pray that you will obey God's will for your life. There's a general will for the body of Christ, the church, and there's a specific will for you. The general will is in God's word. The specific will, he will minister to you as he has equipped you to bring him glory and praise in this world. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word. I pray for your will to be obeyed in our life, in our ministry, in all of our partners' lives and ministries. I pray that we will repent of our shortcoming, that we will know that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that we will open the door of our heart and say, Jesus, forgive me. I have been in error. I was taught wrong. No excuses. I am studying to show myself approved. I love you, and I want your will to manifest in my life and over my family, over my business, and over my country. So today, forgive me of trying to be my own God. Forgive me of allowing all these uh, things to creep in that pulled me away in selfishness apart from you. I want to know you. I want to love you. And I want to serve you. I want to know your will. I want to obey it today, generally for the church, but specifically for my place in the body of Christ. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. For I will serve you with all diligence, with all of my heart, all the days of my life. And I love you, and I praise you, and I thank you for this word today. May it change me and fully charge me to know, to love you 
more than I did when it started. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Listen, I'm Scott Mendes with Western Harvest Ministries. I'm excited that I'll be seeing those in Missouri next weekend. Continue to share this message. Thank you for financially partnering and helping us and, and, and the resources that we sow into your life. All of this is just the work of the ministry. And if we can stand in agreement with you to help you to grow, that's what we want to do. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your time. And remember, until next week, God loves you. We love you. Right on course with your Heavenly Father. I'm Scott Mendes, and make sure to share this with somebody today. Till next week, we'll see you down the road. God bless. Bye-bye.